Hello everyone, and welcome to part 2 of our Godot VR object handling tutorial series. First off, massive shout out to my patrons Christopher and Philip, who both have been giving a lot of feedback around the dancing darts issue we encountered in our last video. So let's quickly revisit that issue. Godot uses the bullet physics engine to simulate physics. We're running into an issue here that has two parts we need to look at to solve it. The default settings for the physics engine assume that one unit is one meter, just like the assumption made in VR. That part is great. However, the physics engine performs best when dealing with sizable objects. We're normally dealing with collision shapes for our environment, for our player or our enemy character. Small objects would only be a few pixels on screen. But in VR, we're far more immersed and can interact directly with far smaller objects, such as our darts. The default settings for the physics engine suddenly don't work too well at this scale. So let's first start by undoing our workaround on the table. We'll open up our table scene and change our collision shape back to our cylinder shape. When we look at the properties of our cylinder shape, we see that we have a margin property which is set to 0.04. That is a margin of 4 centimeters. This margin setting is very important to how Bullet optimizes our physics interactions, and Bullet warns against changing it. But even just looking at our table, we're starting to see a problem. Our table is currently 10 centimeters thick. That leaves only a core of 2 centimeters. Add to that, our dart being far smaller than 4 centimeters in diameter, things start falling apart. Now, interestingly, how the margin is applied differs depending on the type of collision shape. In the case of our cylinder, it's subtracted from the size, while for other shapes it's added. I've linked a video in the description below that does an amazing job at explaining the differences using Blender. Blender also uses Bullet for its physics simulation. We're going to throw caution to the wind and change our margin on our table to be 0.001, which is 1 mm. We need to do the same thing on our dart. When we go to our dart scene, we see how small our dart is and that I had already changed the margin to 1 cm. We are going to change it now to 1 mm. However, this introduces the nasty problems we saw in our last video where our darts dance off the table. Now I've yet to find a really good explanation of how collisions are handled, so I may have gotten the next bit wrong but I think it's close enough to explain what is happening. Our Rift S has a refresh rate of 80 frames per second, and we set our physics engine to match. One frame therefore takes 125 milliseconds. Applying the formula for acceleration we learned in our physics tutorial, we can calculate that an object at rest will try to fall 1.5 millimeters in one frame. That means our dart lying on our table will attempt to penetrate our table by 1.5 millimeters, almost going straight through our margins. Our physics engine will treat this as almost a full collision, move the dart back to where the collision shapes meet, and apply an opposing force related to the distance by which we penetrated our table. I'm guessing the margin also works like a cushion, so to speak. Penetrating by 1.5 millimeters with a 4 centimeter margin, and this opposing force will be nil. Penetrating by 1.5 millimeters with a 1 millimeter margin, and hello dancing dart. So, how do we solve this? We could increase our margins, but we quickly go to a size that doesn't work for our small objects. Luckily for us, acceleration is logarithmic. Let's say we double our physics update rate to 160 updates per second. Now our object in rest will only attempt to move 0.4 millimeters in one update. If we triple our physics update rate to 240 updates per second, we're down to almost 0.15 millimeters. So that is what we're doing. We want our update rate to be a multiple of our frame rate to keep our animation smooth. So I've added a multiplier to our VR subscene. Because increasing our update rate does have a performance penalty, I've kept this at a conservative doubling of the update rate, but Bullet should be able to handle thousands of physics objects even at this rate, especially if we use primitive collision shapes. 
Note that with OpenVR, we can't query the refresh rate of our HMD. Here I suggest setting the physics update rate to a multiple of 90. While setting it at 180 updates per second for a headset that only runs at 72 FPS does mean our physics isn't perfectly in sync, it shouldn't be noticeable to the user. Even experimenting with going as high as 270 would possibly be a good idea. We may end up tweaking our margins more in the long run. Possibly increasing the margins on the table to improve the physics simulation with other objects, but for now I think we have a grip on things. Ok, back to building our dart game. When we throw our dart, the physics engine doesn't simulate any aerodynamics. The dart will travel at whatever angle we release it at. Throw it at a 45 degree angle and it will nicely fly through the air at that angle. So let's implement this accurately by simulating the effect of air pressure on our fins. Now important here is that when our dart flies nicely horizontally, the air passes the fins without exerting any force. If our dart was flying at a 90 degree angle, all the air hits the fins and we exert our maximum force. So our force is going to be based on our angle of attack combined with the speed at which our dart moves through the air. Let's build that. We start by adding a new spatial to our dart and we call this fins. Then we move this into the center of our fins. This will be the location where we will exert our force. Now we need to implement some code, but our dart already has a script attached. We're going to extend that script. We start by adding a variable where we track the position of our previous frame. We give our current global position as its default value. Next, we'll add a variable where we specify a factor with which we can fine tune our air pressure force. We'll implement our logic in our physics function. And we start by determining our new position. And calculating our velocity by subtracting our previous position. And now we can update our last position to remember our new position. We only want to apply our logic if we're not currently holding our dart and if our dart is actually moving. Next, we need to know our angle of attack. For this, we are going to calculate the dot product of our movement vector and the vector that tells us how our dart is oriented. The dot product of two unit vectors, vectors with the length of one, gives us the cosine value of the angle between these two vectors. If the vectors are pointing in the same direction, this value will be 1. If the vectors are perpendicular, this value will be 0. And if the vectors point in opposite directions, this value will be minus 1. We get our orientation vector by accessing our global transforms basis and getting the z vector here. And then we calculate our dot product by calling dot on that vector and passing our normalized movement vector. When our forward vector is parallel with our movement vector, our air pressure will be zero. If our forward vector is perpendicular, we want our air pressure to be the maximum value. We can simply calculate a value between zero and one for this by subtracting the absolute value of our dot product from one. Now we can calculate the force we want to exert on our fins by simply multiplying our movement vector with our inverse dot product and our impulse factor. And finally, we can just call apply impulse, but here we need to do something a little strange. We need the offset of our fins from the center of our dart in global space. And then we provide our impulse. Oh, and I need to fix the name of our dot variable. Now, when we drop our dart, we can see that it tries to reorientate itself and fall with the fins pointing upwards. And when I throw it, we can again see the darts reorienting themselves. Now, I am having some problems here with my recording software messing the timing up, so I'm doing a poor job throwing these darts. I'm looking into buying an external capture device from my patron funds to work around that issue. Before we have a look at our darts actually sticking in our dartboard, we need to fix a problem we introduced here. When we extended our script, this resulted in Godot resetting some of our properties on our darts. 
So we need to reassign our pickup node and our highlight node. And we also need to reselect our picked up layer. Finally, we need to make our point spatial node a child of our root node. In our previous episode, we already set up our dartboard as an area node. Area nodes allow us to detect physics bodies entering our area, but without actually interacting with those bodies. I did mix up the collision mask with the collision layer, so we'll quickly configure our collision layer so we only react to darts hitting our dartboard. Next, we need to create a script for our dartboard so we can implement some logic. And we hook our body entered signal up to a method. Godot will now call this method whenever a dart collides with our area's collision shape. Nothing else will trigger this method. We only want our dart to stick in our dartboard when it hits the dartboard properly. For this, we are going to calculate the angle between our dart and the normal of our dartboard. Hey, didn't we just do something similar before? Yep, our dot product is damn handy. So, for our dartboard normal, we simply get the z vector from our global transforms basis. This is the blue arrow on our dartboard here. We do the same for our dart by getting the z vector from its global transforms basis. Again, this is our blue arrow, but note that it points backwards. But this is great for us, as we get a positive number when our vectors point in the same general direction. We calculate our dot product again. We could use the outcome directly, but for clarity's sake, we're going to convert our dot product to the actual angle by using ACOS and then convert the output from radians to degrees. When this angle is less than 45 degrees, we're going to have our dart stick in our dartboard. In order for our dart to stick into our dartboard, we're simply going to change the rigid body mode to static body. This means the dart will no longer move, but we can still pick it up, and when doing so, our state change will make our dart work again. The harder we throw our dart, the deeper it will penetrate our dartboard. So we want to prevent that and instead position our dart more consistently. Again, we can cheat because we only react to our darts. We want to obtain the location of the point of our dart. We need this location in our dartboard's local space, and we quickly obtain that by calling the inverse transform function on our global transform. Now the z of our point will tell us how deep we penetrated our dartboard, so we can simply move our dart backwards along our dartboard's normal by that distance. We also want to know how many points we scored. And for that, we need to know where on our dartboard our dart hit. First, we need to figure out in which ring our dart is placed, and then in which slice. We already have our point in local space. We quickly convert our 3D point to a 2D point. Now we can calculate the distance from the center of our dartboard. We'll also initialize a score variable. Now I've measured all the rings before, so I'm just pasting that code in. For our red and green bullseyes, we just provide our score, but for every ring, we apply a multiplier to the outcome of a function that provides our base score. So, let's implement that function. Now, each slice has a different score, so I've defined an array of those scores in order as they go around the dartboard. To figure out in which slice our dart landed, we're going to add a helper spatial that helps us identify our score one slice. We call it one and move it into place. Now we can calculate the angle between this spatial's location and where we hit our dartboard. So we start by getting our local position of our new spatial and convert that to a 2D vector. Godot has a handy built-in function that returns the angle between two vectors in radians. Now we can calculate our slice by multiplying 20 with this angle and dividing by 2 times pi. We also floor this value to remove any fraction. This, however, gives us a value from minus 10 to 9, so if our outcome is negative, we need to add 20. Finally, we look up our entry in our array and return that value. We want to keep track of our total score as well, so we add a total variable and add our score to our total. 
We want to visualize this, so we're going to use another helper scene from our XR Tools library. We add our Viewport 2D in 3D subscene and rename that to Scoreboard. We'll make it a little smaller and move it into position. Next we create a new scene, but this will be a 2D scene. And we add a label to the scene that we'll call Score. We give it some default text, so we can see what we're doing. We assign our font to this from our Assets folder. We'll resize our label to the resolution we set on our viewport. And we center our text. Now we save this. We go back to our dartboard scene and select our new score scene as the scene for our viewport. Hmm, that looks a little too pixelated. Let's up the resolution a bit. And change our 2D scene accordingly. Note that our scoreboard doesn't update right away, but it will when it reloads. Back in our code, we're going to calculate a string with our new score and our new total. Now we get our scene instance from our scoreboard and assign this text to our label. It would be more pretty to move some of this code into a script attached to our 2D scene, but this does the job just fine. We do need to fix our typo for our total variable. I've made a few more mistakes. First of all, our point node is with a capital P. And second of all, we need to add to our darts position. Time to test our end result. I'm not very good at throwing, obviously. But, as you can see, our darts hit the dartboard nicely and our score is updated. That's all for this video. We'll continue this series soon by reacting to touching surfaces with our virtual hands. Please consider leaving a like if you found this video useful. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to keep following the series. If you want to support me more directly, please consider joining my Patreon. Thank you for watching, until next time.